You're watching Discipling the Nations broadcast, brought to you by the Fountain of Wisdom Ministries. This broadcast has been made possible by the prayers and support of our partners worldwide. Enjoy as Reverend Kola Iwusho brings the Word of God for today. Hi, I'm Reverend Kola Iwusho. It's such a joy to be able to bring this broadcast to your home. And I'm glad that you are willing to connect and be involved with us. You're investing your time. The message you're about to listen to is going to bless you. I tell you what, God's word is loaded with his wisdom, with his knowledge, with his grace. And as you partake of this message, I believe your life will never be the same. So I want to prepare your heart and get ready to receive God's unadulterated word that can change things in your life. Call your friends and family and let's enjoy this together. God bless you and see you at the end of this broadcast. Amen how to be led by the spirit of god i want to start by giving you the benefits of what it is to be led maybe that will whet more of your appetite some of you may be coming from a different background and you wonder hmm this is one of those things that make people look spooky is that not true someone says the lord let me and you know the enemy has a way of making you have reservations about so many things is that not true so that whenever you think about something you just knock it out of your mind no no i don't want to be a spooky person so i want to say to you that this is not about learning how to be spooky say amen, amen. this is not about learning to walk on cloud nine Ooh, the spirit of god is just mm. I maybe mean, I've seen that and you just, uh, you know, that guy, that guy is a bit eccentric. So, let's, so when you hear how to be led, the enemy flashes those pictures in your mind. <laughs> I'm fine the way I am. No, no, that's, that's, that, that's not what you should do. To, to, to be led means that you have balance in your life. Amen. Say amen. amen. To be led also means that you will have a sense of direction. You will not be wondering in the, in the midst of darkness, not knowing where you're going with your life. To be led means that you will be empowered to function correctly like you should. Say loud, amen. amen. To be led means that you will be in the will of God. <laughs> God will never lead you to where his grace will not sustain you. To be led means that you will succeed in doing what God's plans are for your life. Amen. To be led means that you are sure you're coming into maturity. So I want to lay aside the fears that many of us have. And, and they are founded on, on experiences of other people. Because you, you see so many people who claim to be led by the Spirit of God, doing weird things. And a lot of people get put off by that. And you think, oh, if that's Christianity, God help us. And the reason is because the leadings of the Holy Spirit can be very subjective. And so this has led to confusion. Some people just come up and say, well, why did you do that? I said, God led me. And you know, because of the subjectivity behind it, it becomes very difficult for anybody to know how to judge whether that is truly of the Lord or not. So you're welcome this morning to the land of understanding. Amen. We're on a journey and we're going to know some things. Say amen. amen. What are the hindrances to being led? One of them is what I just said, the preconceptions we have about what it means to be led. Another one is an independent spirit. I want you to know that one of the things that Satan did in the Garden of Eden, he did three things. He created mistrust, disbelief, and disobedience. How about say mistrust? The first thing Satan did was to let them begin to doubt the integrity of God. The second thing he did is that he made them to disbelieve what God wanted them to do and what God wanted to achieve. And then he led them into disobedience. He's still doing the same today. Mistrust. You know, some people have the notion that if you give yourself to God, God will take you to places where you don't want to go. And God will make you do the things you hate to do. Where did those thoughts come from? Hell. And he knows how to highlight examples of people who have done weird things. And he says, do you want to be like that? No. I'm fine the way I am. Now, all he's trying to do is to create in us, and we all have it to some extent, an independence of God. Like I was saying some other time, I said that God is love. By his love, he draws us. Is that not true? But God is light. By his light, we are scared to come close. Because his light will penetrate all the darkness in our souls. And it's like, 
God is so holy. I don't want to get too close to him. Is that not true? So there's that tension there. So we want to get rid of an independent spirit. God designed you and I to be dependent on him. Shall I say that one more time? You were designed for a dependent relationship on God. You will never fulfill all the potentials that are in you until you have a healthy relationship with God that will reveal the potentials he put in you. They say you don't ask the thing about its potential. You ask its creator about its potential. You don't go and see a car and say, car, show me your potentials. The car will just be staring at you. But when you read the manual of the manufacturer, you can tell the potential that is in the car. So also when you go to God, he's the only one that can tell you the potentials that are in you. Because you don't know them. Am I talking here? You don't know them. So, you want to get rid of an independent spirit. You want to get rid of an unteachable heart. Following your own agenda. Even as believers, many people follow their own agenda. You want to get rid of an unteachable heart. Also, you want to get rid of worldliness. There's a spirit of the world. I want, I want, I want. It's called loss of the eyes, loss of the flesh, and pride of life. I want you to know that what you program into your system will determine what comes out of it. Mm-hmm. Do you hear what I said? What you program into your system will do what? They, there are different brands of Christianity today. Have you noticed that? <laughs> there are some Christians that just do weird things and they say, I'm led. And you can't judge them. Oh, don't judge me. Don't judge me. <laughs> you know, some Christians are living in sin and say, well, God understands. Hallelujah. <laughs> some wild things are going on around today but thank God for his word amen. amen so today we're going to allow Jesus to introduce us to the person of the Holy Spirit are you ready for him to do that yeah. it starts in John chapter 14 John chapter 14 from verse 15 Jesus himself begins to tell us about this heavenly resource you know what I call him a heavenly resource amen when you come in contact with him, he comes in to take you to another dimension of heavenly potentials, divine potentials. Hallelujah. Things that are available because of his presence. Let me also debunk another thing. How many of you feel that there is a day appointed for you to die? You all believe that? And it's based on the scripture that says there is, uh, it's appointed unto men once to die and after death judgment is that not true okay but does the bible say with long life i will satisfy you does the bible also say that there are some things wicked people do that can shorten their lives so if there's a day appointed to you how come the things you do can determine the day you die shall i say it again let me take it again we all believe that there's a day appointed for us to die true or false But the Bible says that if we honor our parents, honor your father and mother, and it shall be well with you, and you will live long. And there are some things you can do that can shorten your life. So if there's a day appointed, how come the things you do can determine the day you die? That means there was no day appointed. Should I say it again? Everyone believes, and I did too, that... I know that's a day appointed. Because the Bible says that it's appointed unto men once to die and after death, judgment. But I was listening to a man of God and he said, a voice came to him when he was young and says, this is the day appointed for you to die. And he sat down expecting to die. Because the voice came like a supernatural experience. But as he began to run through the scriptures in his mind, began to run references on his mother's Bible, he found that there were certain things he could do that would prolong his days. Therefore, he understood, it's not appointed for me to die today. Do you understand? That means that there are some things you can do that will change some things. Did you catch that? How many of you received that? Okay. What about events in life? Can our prayers change the outcome of events? So how then do we determine 
whether God wants this to happen or Satan wants that to happen. If you and I can engage with God, our prayers can determine the outcome. So the outcome is not fixed. Think about it. The outcome is not what? Because there's a certain thought pattern that has prevailed. Whether it's from the Greek mythology or some things, it's so strong in us that it's as if no matter what we do, some things are fixed. I'm here to tell you not all things are that fixed. Otherwise, the power to engage in God and His Holy Spirit and prayer and the name of Jesus that can change things means that the things that will come out of any situation is open for whosoever can pay the price. That should rise, make you rise up with strength and confidence that if God is on our side and the greater one is on the inside of us, we're going to see changes in this earth. Amen. Did you catch what I just said? We're going to see what? Changes. changes. Now, the man, when the apostle was around, he said that at the 400th year, when God had given Abraham the word, that the children of Israel will leave Egypt. Do you remember that? Yeah. He said at that time, there was nobody hungry for God. So the 400 year passed. Did you catch that? But when it was 400 and what? 30. A new generation came up and said, you know what? We want out. And they began to cry out to God. And their crying out facilitated the will of God in coming to pass. In other words, 430 years ago, the will of God was that they should be delivered, but it didn't happen until 430 years. Did you get the point? So, who determined the outcome? The praying people. Now, God in his mercy has put some boundaries around the events of the earth. Is that not true? But what will determine the outcome in every generation is a participation with God for his will to be done. Amen. Can you see what knowledge does? It knocks off the limitations that we have put because of the faith, I mean the F-A-T-E understanding. <laughs> you know, some people believe that they are doomed not to make it. No matter what they do in life, you know, that's their lot. True or false? That's where the class system came from. If you are a poor man, stay poor or your life. And if you are rich, stay rich or your life. Thank God that in Christ Jesus there is no class system. Yeah. You can break everything. Okay, so I said that to say that I want to get your attention so we listen closely. And stop allowing preconceptions to interpret truth. Say amen. amen. John 14 verse 15 jesus begins by saying these words if you really love me you will keep obey my commands i'm reading from the amplified translation and i will ask the father and he will give you another comforter counselor helper intercessor advocate strengthener and stand by that he may remain with you forever verse 17 says the spirit of truth everybody said the spirit of truth I like that identity about the Holy Spirit. It's called the Spirit of Truth. It says, whom the world cannot receive. So, he's not about to give the Holy Spirit to the world. Listen to that very closely. Because a lot of people think that everybody has the Holy Spirit. No, he's not about to give the Holy Spirit to the world. The world cannot receive him. Why? Because it does not see him or know and recognize him. But you know and recognize him. For he lives with you and will be in you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, fallen, helpless. I will come back to you. Just a little while now and the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I leave, you will leave also. At that time when the day comes, you will know for yourselves that I am in the Father and you are in me. And I am in you. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. Whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and show, reveal myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. Can I hear an amen? amen. 
can you see the condition you look at verse 15 let's just take it one at a time it says if you really love me you will obey my commands and i will ask the father he will give you another command. i want you to get the foundation for which the spirit of god has been asked to come to us that if we love jesus and keep his commandments the father will send the spirit and the spirit will now do what needs to be done because of the foundation of love and keeping the commandments it's so important you get that because a lot of times people just say, Holy Spirit told me this. Holy Spirit told me that. And sometimes you look at them and you know there is no Holy Spirit anywhere. You are the one speaking to yourself. <laughs> Let's go on. Um, if you skip over to verse 24. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teaching. And the teaching which you hear and heed is not mine, but comes from my Father who sent me. I have told you these things I am still with, while I'm still with you. But the Comforter, the Paracletos, the Counselor, the Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, Standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you what? all things and i will cause you to recall will remind you of bring to your remembrance everything i have told you peace i leave with you that's one way to know when the holy ghost is at work is somebody hearing me here peace i leave with you you see i'm reading it in the context so we get the gist all these preconceptions that we have about god is designed sometimes by the enemy to keep us from god so when you read the Bible with open eyes, you see that it is not what we thought it was. My peace, I live with you. That means that when the Holy Ghost is moving, we can see peace prevailing. Watch this. Peace, I live with you. My own peace, I give you and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Say amen. amen. So, but because we're going to concentrate on the Holy Spirit, I just want you to get two things out of what we've seen in chapter 14. Number one, he is the spirit of truth. Amen. And number two, he will teach you all things. Amen. It's called the comforter. It means somebody who is called alongside to help you. Stand by, strengthener. He's a heavenly resource. And another thing you will take note of, he will not speak of his own. In other words, he's not about to have a new agenda and he wants to do something different. He wants to continue what Jesus started in your life. That's important because now you have the word of God as the foundation, the Holy Ghost as the helper. So that your navigation, your journey in life, your travel in life is aided on one side with the word of God, on the other side with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit illuminates the word and the word confirms the working of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? amen. It's so important you know that because it's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about your progression in God. It's all about your walk with God. It's all about you becoming all that God wants you to be. Satan had a, a clash with the human race in the garden of eden and he derailed god's purpose momentarily is that not true jesus christ came as the last adam to restore god's purposes the holy ghost has now been sent to continue what jesus started in other words coming into character coming into excellence coming into the things that god has ordained is what the holy ghost was sent to do say amen, amen. that's why it says i will not leave you as orphans i will come back to you how will he come back to us by his spirit now let's flip over to John 15 and let's read the second level of introduction he gave the Holy Spirit. Verse 26. Verse 26. I don't know why he keeps contrasting the, the world and the Spirit. He wants us to understand that whereas when we preach to the world, we preach Jesus to them. But when we talk about the Holy Ghost, we talk to the children of God. You know, he says, uh, which of you being evil will give something wrong? To your children when they ask you it says so also when the children ask the father he will give them the holy spirit amen. so the spirit is for the children say amen. amen so if you're not born again get born again amen. so you can receive the infilling of the holy spirit i want to say this that in salvation the holy spirit was at work through the word don't get me wrong but there's a separate experience from being born again and being filled with the holy spirit there are two different experiences so when you are born again, you are ready to be filled with the Spirit. Amen. 
So people need to be filled with the Spirit for them to enjoy the fullness of the Spirit. In John 15, 26, it says, But when the Comforter, the Counselor, Helper, Advocate, Intercessor, stand by, when he comes, whom I will send from the Father, once again he calls him what? The Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father. He himself will testify regarding me, but you also, you also will testify and be my witnesses because you've been with me from the beginning. Just go to chapter 16 before we make any comments from verse 7. However, I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. And when he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness, uprightness of heart, and about judgment, about sin. His work is to convict the world of sin because they do not believe amen and believe or trust and rely on and about righteousness because i go to the father that means that the world's disbelief is what is re- resulting in their sinfulness when he goes to the father righteousness is made available to us he says he will convict them about it and then about judgment because the ruler of this world is judged amen you know this is heavy but i want to still focus on him i will have i still have many things to say to you but you are not able to bear them or to take them upon you or to grasp them. How many of you know that there are some things that God would like to say to us, but we're not quite ready? How many of you know that there are things that you want to say to a friend and you know the friend is not in the frame of mind to hear that? If you're smart, you just leave it alone. That's what he was telling them. I said, many things I want to say, but you're not able to bear them or take them now. But when he, the spirit of what? See, all the time he's informing us about him. He's calling him the spirit of what? The spirit of what? The spirit of what? So truth means reality. The spirit of the reality of who God is. Spirit of the reality of who you are in God. Spirit of the reality of how God ordained for things to be done. Truth. Everybody say truth. Everybody say truth. truth. We all need truth. Is that not true? We need truth. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is called the spirit of truth. In another place, the Bible calls the word of God the word of truth. So we must come to terms with the fact that there is truth from God. Now, you can create your own truth. This is where subjective things come in. You can create your own truth. You can talk yourself into believing anything. You know, you can tell yourself you are a monkey, you are a monkey, you are a monkey, you are a monkey. And after a while, you start thinking like one, looking like one, acting like one. And you have defined your own reality. Hello? No, that's the reality. Anything you... God designed the human race that whatever choice they make, they will accept it as their own reality. So he gives us the opportunity to choose his own reality. So if we accept his own reality, his own reality will subdue whatever other reality we have around and we can embrace his own reality. Amen. Am I talking here? So we need to understand that. I still have many things to say, but when he comes, he will, he will guide you into what? The whole full truth. For he will not speak of his own message or his own authority, but he will tell you whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come. That will happen in the I love that. He will tell you the things to come, not only about the nations, but about your life. Amen. Don't you think that he's, it's an advantage for you to know somebody who knows the things to come? Amen. So you can be positioned for the things to come. Say amen. amen. This is the edge the Christians you have over the world. We know we have an idea of the things. You know, when we read about what's going on in the world today, you know the Bible already tells us that it's going to happen. That's the truth. It is already said so. So we know that these things are true. It says, um, it will reveal, transmit, disclose things to God. Everything that the Father has is mine. And that is what I meant when I said that He, the Spirit, will take things that are mine and will reveal, declare, disclose, transmit. That means He's, he's going to disclose things about what the Father has and has made available to us through Jesus that we, in the natural sense, do not know. The Spirit will show us. The Spirit will tell us, hey, you know you have authority in the name of Jesus. The Spirit will tell you, you know what? You have divine resources on the inside of you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
And the power of God in you is so great. When Paul grabbed this thing, he said, God will grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of uh, the, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened that you might know the hope of his calling, the inheritance he has in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of the power that is at work toward you who believe. There are so many things working for us that we don't know. And this spirit of truth has been given to help us to know. Well, I mean, you're going to be on an adventure. <laughs> you know, the spirit of truth is going to show you all kinds of things. Don't let the preconception of spookiness put you away from him. Say a loud amen. amen. Say a very loud amen. amen. All right, so now let's now turn to Romans 8 and now look at that verse 14 again, but this time read it in context from, from verse 1. So we get the gist of it. Romans 8 is loaded. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who live, not, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has done what? Set me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. The law of lift has set you free from the law of gravity. Say amen. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free. For God has done what the law could not do. Its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and has an offering for sin, and as an offering for sin, God condemns sin in the flesh. Say amen. So that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the spirit. Our lives governed not by the standards according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit and are controlled by the desires of the spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the spirit. Now, the mind of the flesh, which is the sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the miseries around, surrounding, arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, both now and forever. That is, because the mind of the flesh, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God, for it does not submit itself to God's law. I want you to take note of that. The mind of the flesh is enmity against God and it cannot and does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So then those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please God or be acceptable to him. But you are not living the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, directs and controls you, but if anyone does not possess the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He doesn't belong to Christ. He's not truly a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt, the spirit is alive because of righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you so then brethren we are not debtors we are debtors sorry but not to the flesh we're not obligated to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set by the dictates of the flesh but if you live according to the dictates of the flesh for if you live according to the dictates of the flesh you will surely die but if through the power of the holy spirit you habitually you are habitually put into death the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Now, can you see the context? Paul was making a discussion from the chapter 1 of Romans. He was giving us the doctrine about salvation, about redemption, and about all of that. And it got to a point, he now began to discuss, as human beings, we are, when we are born again, our spirits have been recreated but our souls have been trained in sin you get the gist and now we have a choice whether to yield to the carnal nature or to yield to the holy spirit now what is encouraging us to do is, is that the more we practice yielding to the holy spirit and the determining factor is the mind the mind is like the switch you either switch on carnality or you switch on spirituality 
Well, that's all we have for you today, but we hope you've enjoyed this message and have allowed God to truly touch your heart. If you have testimonies or you need prayers or would like to hear more messages, contact us via our website, www.fowm.org. See you next time.